Welcome to Module 2, The Big Bang Theory and the Parameters of Our Universe. This is the second module in a 12-module series entitled God and Modern Physics. It is presented by Father Robert J. Spitzer of the Maja Center of Reason and Faith, and it is based on his recently released book, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy. Welcome to the Magis Center of Reason and Faith series, God and Modern Physics. I'm Father Robert Spitzer, and we're talking about the evidence for creation, for God, for supernatural design that comes from contemporary physics, contemporary astrophysics, and cosmology. We've been talking about the standard Big Bang model, and now we're going to get more deeply into what our universe looks like today and, and a little bit more deeply into the standard Big Bang model, um, which we said uh, uh, assumes that the universe began 13.7 billion years ago with this huge explosion. We were talking about, well, what are the universal constituents? And we noted uh, that 4.6% uh, of the universe was visible matter, and we noted, too, that 23% was dark matter, and that the rest, 72.4%, was this uh, field, this dark energy field that's connected with space-time, and, and it's uh, causing a repulsive force which causes the universe to expand, and even to be expanding and speeding up to this very day. We now want to just take a, a little bit more of a look into well, this visible matter that emits light, absorbs light, it does things electrical and luminescent. What's it like? Well, we know there's a very finite amount of visible matter, and, and it's approximately equal to 10 to the 53 kilograms. That's a lot of matter in the universe, but it's a very finite amount of matter, very different from the universe of Sir Isaac Newton, where he assumed that the universe was infinite in time and infinite in mass. And, and now we see that really the amount of visible matter is, is only 10 to the 53 kilograms. And what that amounts to is 10 to the 80 baryons. A baryon is, is a proton or a neutron which has the, the, the major amount of rest mass in the universe, about protons and neutrons. And so we see then that uh, 10 to the 80 baryons, that's a lot of baryons, it's a lot of protons and neutrons, but it's a very, very finite number. And, and these baryons are doing all kinds of things. Well, what we're going to see is that they're organized around four forces in the universe. And we're going to explain each one of these forces. But for the time being, let's say that these 10 to the 80 baryons, they're collected into 10 to the 11 galaxies uh, and in about 10 to the 22 stars. So what are these four universal forces? Um, the electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force, the weak force, and the gravitational force. Let's just describe each one so you get a sense of what's making our universe work. Uh, the electromagnetic force, we've already seen what that does. And I think anyone who's turned on a flashlight, turned on an electric stove, done anything with electricity or with light, uh, you know that this is, of course, a, a force that does so much of the work, so much of the complex systems uh, in our universe that make our, our, our universe operate. Uh, and then we have a second force, which is called the strong nuclear force. And, and, and many of you know uh, that uh, protons are combined together in the nucleus of an atom. And you probably also know that protons, being similarly charged, should repel each other. But in point of fact, how is it that all these protons can be gathered together in the nucleus of an atom when they should be repelling each other? Well, the answer is that there's a stronger force, a very, very strong force that becomes operative when matter gets so close together in a very high energy collision that um, all of a sudden this force turns on, which was never turned on before, when, it, when uh, the two protons get close to each other and it literally binds these two protons together, overcoming this repelling electromagnetic force uh, from uh, the similar charges of the protons. And, and those are the strong nuclear force. W without the strong nuclear force, we, we wouldn't have the periodic table. We wouldn't have the diversity of elements in the periodic table, which comes, of course, from bigger and bigger nuclei coming from uh, the strong nuclear force's bonding uh, capability. 
The third force is the weak force, and, and the weak force gives rise to decay, nuclear decay. It gives rise to radiation and uh, all kinds of essential properties. Decay and radiation are very, very important to the evolution of the universe, as we shall see in later segments. And finally, the fourth force, which all of you are probably aware of, uh, that's called the gravitational force or the gravitational attraction force. But really, um, it, it's attributable to the dynamics of the space-time field. It's, it's not a force and in the same sense as the strong nuclear force or the electromagnetic force, but nevertheless, it has a very strong power of attraction. And that attraction causes either things to slow down or to draw closer to each other according uh, to uh, mass density. So uh, the, the higher the degree of mass density, the, the stronger uh, the... Um, uh, the uh, gravitational force, or what we'd say the stronger uh, the effects upon the space-time continuum. Speaking of the space-time continuum, well, well what is it? Um, space-time continuum is not like an empty vacuum. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton thought that it was, but in point of fact, space is really like a field. A and space as a field is a very dynamic thing. Uh, space actually can warp. Space can actually change its uh, uh, coordinate system. I its coordinate system can be compressed according to the density of mass energy in a particular region. It can actually compress the space-time field. A and that compression of the space-time field has radical effects upon the mass energy in that area, it can reduce the size of the mass energy, it can draw things to itself, it can, come, it can uh, give rise to black holes where all of the mass of a star can be collapsed into 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and this huge compressed gravitational field that we call a black hole can be uh, emanating from it. A and so space-time then is, is a very dynamic thing. It vibrates, it warps, it compresses, etc., etc. And, and of course, mass energy affects the space-time field, and the space-time field actually affects mass energy. So this is a very dynamic, organic universe in which we live. There really isn't a void. There really isn't this empty space out there. It really is this dynamic interactivity between mass energy and space-time field. And, of course, you can get the idea now to go back to our balloon, and, and let's just examine for a second, what if the entire space-time field were collapsed into the minutest size above a dimensionless point? Just think of the universe being that approximately 13.7 billion years ago. That's the standard Big Bang model. That's what the vast, vast, vast majority of physicists accept, that the universe was literally at this, you know, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, approximately 13.7 billion years ago, and then it blows up in this cataclysmic explosion. And then with the cataclysmic explosion, what occurs is that the universe then expands like this balloon. Everything starts moving away from everything else. And of course, as it moves away from everything else, nothing is really at the center because everything is somewhere on the surface of the balloon. So maybe everything is like a center, but nothing is at the center. There's no privileged part of the surface of that balloon. And as the balloon, namely space-time field, the elastic of the balloons like the space-time field, as it continues to expand, notice too that everything is moving away from everything else. And so, of course, the universe just continues to get larger and larger. Now, what is the assumption of the standard Big Bang model? The assumption of the standard Big Bang model, though it is unproven, is that the universe began 13.7 billion years ago. In other words, the Big Bang itself is the beginning of the universe. The universe, with its forces, its space-time field, and its constants, are thrown into, is thrown into existence in a single moment, 13.7 billion years ago. It begins with this fiery explosion, continues to expand. And what do we know about that? 
We assume that that might be true, but that has not yet been proven to be true, but it has not been proven to be untrue. And so we need to discuss this throughout the rest of this series. To learn more about this series and the Magis Center of Reason and Faith, please visit www.magisreasonfaith.org. That is www.magisreasonfaith dot org. You may purchase Father Spitzer's book on this subject, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy, on the website or through Amazon.com.